everyone and welcome to Shaw TV and our annual Whistler Cup special. My name is Christy Alexich and today I'm looking forward to looking back at some of the highlights from over the years. From what it takes to put this event on, to the amazing people involved, and the athletes who have been a part of it all. There are so many great stories that come out of the Whistler Cup. So let's gear up for 2018 by looking back at some of the best. As the dust settles from the 2018 Winter Olympic Games, we turn now to the younger generation of future Olympians. Each spring, hundreds of young ski racers travel here from around the world for what is one of the most important juvenile ski races in North America, ready to battle it out in their nation's honor. Now in its 26th year, the Worcester Cup will see athletes from over 20 countries competing for the top spot in their division and as a team for the coveted Worcester Cup. Let's kick things off by throwing back to 2014, when host Heather Butts had a chance to dig around and find out more about how this event began, and also had the opportunity to chat to some Olympians who have been a part of it. It was the early 90s. Canada's Alpine team was skiing strong, but it was time to start building a new breed of Canadian ski racers, and hosting an event of Olympic proportions was the best way to do it. The legendary Trofeo Topolino already existed in Europe, but visionaries Max Meyer, Joja Sporovic, and Jim Yates saw a need for an event in North America. More than 180 World Cup and Olympic athletes started in the gates at the Whistler Cup. Most recently, American Michaela Schifrin won gold in GS at the Whistler Cup in 2010 and won that same medal in slalom at the Sochi Olympics just four years later. The same goes for Julia Mancuso, Lindsay Vaughn and Tina Maze. Canadian Olympic Golden Girls Ashley McIver and Marielle Thompson chased the cup only a few years ago. And then there's the Canadian Cowboys. Jan Hudex raced in the first Whistler Cup and he went on to end Canada's 20-year Alpine drought, winning bronze in Sochi. His teammate Mike Janik was practically raised on this mountain, getting his first taste of international competition at the Whistler Cup. Retiring after 14 years on the national team, he still has fond memories of the event that helped build his career. And whether you go on to uh, be a ski racer or go into anything else in life, to be in an international competition at that age, it opens your eyes. And the more we can, you know, lift our heads and see what else is around, it gives a, lot, a larger perspective to, to our lives and where we want to go. A new year means a fresh start and the Nations Cup is up for grabs. The Swiss had it for a year and then Canada claimed it back in 2013, a title they plan to defend. But after a hiatus, the Austrians have returned and are hungry for a win. As a matter of fact, the Austrians did win the cup in 2014, followed by Norway in 2015 and 2016, and then just last year, Switzerland bringing home the cup in 2017 after a five-year hiatus. Who will win the cup in 2018? Only time will tell, but the rumor has it, the Canadians are determined to keep that cup on home soil. Now, over the years, over 10,000 racers have competed in the Whistler Cup, many of whom have gone on to compete in the World Cup circuit and in the Olympics. Flashing back to 2016, Vanessa Ibarra had a chance to catch up with some of the young ski racers to find out what it takes to make it to the top. She may have put these gloves on a thousand times, but for Ella Ranzoni, today's gear up is a special one. It's really exciting. Ella is one of a few Whistler U16 racers who has been chosen to forerun the downhill course here at March's Canadian Championships in Whistler. There's no denying preparing to go down the same run as BC and Canada's best is an experience she won't forget, but it's also one that she's earned. The Whistlerite placed second in slalom at the 2014 Whistler Cup, as well made this year's Whistler Cup BC team for the fourth year in a row. It's really exciting because it means I can have a better bib and have a faster track. You guys, come on, up, up, up. 
While all Mr. Cup athletes dream of being at the top of their discipline, Ella actually is. In fact, all of these alpine ski racers have worked their way up to being some of the best in the country. So what does it take to get to the top? For four-time Whistler Cup participant, now BC Development Team racer Brody Seeker, 90% of it is mental. Facing hardships and dealing with bad days is the best way to progress mentally. It's all about how you go into your next competition, your next training day figure out how to reset and, and come into the next uh, race day or training day with a good focus. For Ella, her warm-ups begin with positive visualization. I like to think that like already I've finished and how I feel then so that I know what I want to do to be like that. For some people the mental side can get to them. They overthink it and then they screw up on the sections that they're really worried about. You need to be focused on what's ahead of you and not looking back at what's happened. Close mentorships have also proved a valuable tool for the 15-year-old. BC ski racer Stephanie Fleckenstein, among the pro athletes she's turned to for advice throughout the years. I want to be like them when I'm older, so I like to see how they got there. As for World Cup competitor Broderick Thompson and so many other racers, they credit the Mike and Manny camp for helping them get to where they are today. It's a four-day camp here in Whistler, run by Mike Janik and Manny osborne Parody, who are both ex-racers with the Whistler Mountain Ski Club, and they bring in kids from all across Canada. A lot of the participants are uh, Whistler Cup U16 racers. So it's a really fun time. They get to see athletes got to the highest level of their sport, and they get to see the pathway maybe a little bit more clear. Now that broderick has gone and crushed that path, he now makes it a point to pass along what his idols taught him in order to help younger racers, such as 15-year-old Miles, climb the ranks. I met Broderick two or three years ago. I used to like put a lot of pressure on myself and like he just told me that like at the younger ages you don't need to worry about all these things too much because if you just keep skiing and having fun at that age you'll be good when you're older and that's when it really matters. Anything you can help them with technique wise or off the hill, on the hill, dry land like I've done with Eric Gay and Manny gives you more confidence to know that the older guys are doing that. Today Miles is one of BC's best. He and Ella may credit a positive mind and close mentorships for helping get them where they are today, but like all champs, it's nothing without a love of the sport. There's not that much other stuff that I'd rather do on any day. The speed, the air, and also the opportunities that it gives you in life. I mean, outside of racing itself, getting to travel, it's really fun. Really, there's no limits. Something with the snow, I just like either skiing in it or just playing in it. I just love it. At the end of the day, I want to be dead tired knowing I gave it my all. Already, this is Ella Renzoni. She is pushing this 116.93. Now, Broderick Thompson just got back from competing in the 2018 Winter Olympic Games in Pyeongchang, South Korea. Another awesome story about an athlete coming out of the Whistler Cup and going on to great success on the world stage. Working hard to do what you love, it's not always easy. And back in 2017, host Sarah Wright had a chance to talk to a young ski racer who sets a fine example of perseverance. I just love the speed and the technical part of just skiing. It's fun to just hit the gate. I just like going fast. 13-year-old Chase Burns out of Manning Ski Club has been ski racing since he was five years old. But recently, something has tried to slow him down. In December, he was doing a lot of training during the Christmas holidays with his skiing. Uh, he was also playing on his basketball team at school with the holidays. We noticed, we started noticing that he was getting, he was really tired and he was really grumpy, but we just kind of brushed it off that he was a typical teenager. Like I could barely make it down the run all the time and I was just really tired. I always had to go to the washroom and whenever I had the chance I would always just get, a, get some water. The last kind of thing was just even walking up the stairs um, to go brush his teeth was a chore. With sunken eyes, extreme thirst, and drastic weight loss, a trip to the hospital on January 6th confirmed suspicions of type 1 diabetes. It wasn't that much of a shock when we got there. It was a, maybe a little bit of a relief because we knew that what it was. And then that's when all of the learning <laughs> started for the next five days in the hospital. 
I didn't know a lot. I thought I was one of those people that thought you have to just like cut down on sugar. But once I started learning, I just knew that that's not how it is. It's just all the counting of carbs and stuff. However, checking labels at mealtime isn't foreign for this Abbotsford family. He was diagnosed with celiac disease at 16 months. So he's always had to be aware of what he's eating and his choices. So now reading one side, ingredient list, now we're just transitioning and reading the other side. We have to count the carbs, how many carbs are in each product. So the bread, for example, we know there's 12 grams per slice. The muffin, 30. This has um, 24 grams, and then you always minus the fiber. Even with these precautions and injecting insulin at least five times a day, emotions, adrenaline, and several other factors can still cause Chase's blood sugar level to drop. When I'm low, I get kind of dizzy. I just don't feel like I can do much. And then my eyes, I see yellow lights and stuff, then I get really shaky, and then I know. How's it going? <laughs> Good. Are you feeling okay? Yeah. Yeah, what's your level? Ideally, Chase, his family, and his coach want to know his levels before he gets those feelings. 13.1. And now they can with the use of their smartphones. He still goes about his day as usual, but he has to check, check his, his blood glucose with his monitor. But we also have this new Dexcom, which makes it a lot easier. We know where his levels are going, so we can kind of get an idea with the phone. With all this extra effort, some may wonder why anyone would continue to race competitively. To be honest, initially I was a little bit worried just because I wasn't sure how that was going to work out. But then once you know people started telling us, the doctors, his coach even too, started doing research and there's a lot of professional athletes that all have been successful with type 1. I was kind of scared for skiing. I didn't know what was going to happen, but it all turned out fine. His dad and I are very proud of him. Even on the way to emergency, he had a moment of, why me? But as soon as his dad got to the hospital, his positive outlook and his mindset just changed right from there, and he just said, he's, he's got this. I just want to be one of the people that just, you know you can do something, even if something's trying to stop you. Chase was up racing just two days after leaving the hospital, and now he's back and ready to compete for his second time at the Whistler Cup. For a Whistler Cup, I'd be happy with like a top 15, top 10. I'm excited. Last year, it was fun, and all the things that you get to do, it's just a really neat experience. The stakes are high, and these young athletes have already been training for years, working on their speed and agility with sheer determination and passion. Stick around, because after the break, we've got more Whistler Cup stories. Welcome back to Shaw TV and our annual Whistler Cup special. I'm here now in Whistler Village, where from April 13th to the 15th, this whole area will be a buzz with athletes from around the world here to compete in the Whistler Cup. Now, as you can imagine, you can't have a world-class ski race with anything less than a perfectly groomed course. So let's head back to 2015 when host Vanessa Ibarra had a chance to go behind the scenes to chat to some people who work around the clock to make sure that each run is race ready. Meet the man behind the cat. This is a conventional snow cat that we use for working on the flatter areas. For a lot of the race course work, we do use cats with, that have a winch to assist it for traction going up steep slopes. Just as skiers and snowboarders are ending their day, Mike Stone is only just beginning. Mike's been working as a cat ski operator here on Whistler Blackcomb for almost 30 years. The Whistlerite laying down countless tracks for ski racing competitions. I've worked a lot of ski races over the years, World Cups when we had them here, and the Olympics when they were here. And I still go in the fall and work at Lake Louise for the men's races. You have to be very deliberate with your preparation of the snow. If there's a fresh snowfall, a lot of times you have to clear the snow off the race surface itself, and you have to do that at a specific time. You want a, a good surface for the athletes. Last night turned out good. 
It worked out good. So Rain and Mike both, it worked out great. Mike is part of the large Whistler Blackcomb snow team who work around the clock, making sure every run is built, groomed, and maintained to near, if not perfection, for alpine events such as this week's Whistler Cup. The jumps are all built, right? So all we have left to do is probably free Upper Dave. When we start back in November to make the snow, you know, we have uh, snowmakers, moving guns, uh, making sure that all the snow guns are producing the type of snow that we want, which is quite wet and dense. As we get the snow made, then the groomers come in and they start pushing it around. For the speed event, the Super G, you like to have larger terrain features, so larger rolls or bumps and jumps. Slalom is basically just fairly hard, uh, the most durable snow. For this operator and his crew, the biggest challenge is Mother Nature, which is why the WB squad has close to a dozen snowcats and operators on standby at a time, ready to grab the wheel the minute the weather turns. If it stops snowing at 2 in the morning, you go to work at 2 in the morning. It's more a mindset than a skill set, I think. It's, you, have to have, you have to be dedicated to the success of the race and you know, sort of be willing to do the, the finicky work that you have to do to make it work. And it isn't just operators doing the finicky work. So we're going after 75. Meet Patrick, head of the Whistler Weasels. Don't ski the line, push the stuff as far away from the line as you can. This boss has been weaseling at Whistler Cups, World Cups, and a number of Olympics for over 15 years. Further down the mountain, he and his team is in charge of manually smoothing out any dangerous ruts, excess snow, or slippery sections that pop up on race courses. The races are running at uh, 45 second intervals, so they've got to get from one station to the next in 45 seconds. It can get stressful, <laughs> but it is what it is, it's ski racing. As hard as this entire Whistler team works to fail-proof the mountain, this is ski racing. Crashes are bound to happen. We recognize that the person that runs first and the person that runs last are not going to have an identical track. All this crew can do is try their best to provide racers with the smoothest, safest run possible. For Mike, his hours and views may blur together, but being able to play an often overlooked role in athletes' journey to the podium makes this ride an exciting one. You want them to have a good experience because they they're really are the future of ski racing. Everybody contributes. You're probably not surprised by how many people it would take to pull off an event of this size, but what might surprise you is just how many of those people are volunteers. Let's rewind back to 2014 when host Tim Chung had a chance to talk to a few dedicated moms who are just as passionate about ski racing as their athletic offspring. Putting together an international ski competition requires expertise, organization, and dedication. And here at the Whistler Cup Command Center, um, just create start list. all of that comes in the form of a handful of hard-working moms and dads. And in race office, we're usually the first on the hill and the last, last to go to bed. So, yeah, it's hectic all the way through. And with just hours before the official start, it's a race against the clock to organize and finalize start lists, bibs, and event schedules. Packages done in advance, list labeled in advance, um, probably a good week ahead of time. And then once we come down to race days like now, then it's a lot of hours during the day for, as you can see, there's a lot of staff in the office here. The Whistler Cup is run almost exclusively by volunteers doing everything from course work to judging to logistics. Um, I think it's absolutely amazing. This race here is just an absolutely amazingly organised race that just keeps going each year up and up. And that's thanks to decades of dedication. Some volunteers like Liz Cullen have been doing this for almost 20 years, long after her child's participation in Whistler Cup. So what brings these moms back year after year? Watching your kids race is an amazing thing and being involved in the sport that they're involved in is, is a really wonderful feeling. The Worcester Cup is often regarded as a family affair, which as you just saw, it's not always just about the family that come out and volunteer, but how many people come out as a cheering squad. Case in point, the Reed family. We had a chance in 2013 to talk to crazy Canuck, Ken Reed, and he told us about how the Worcester Cup brings generations of his family together. One of the really fun things that we've had for nearly a decade is being able to come to Whistler Cup and cheer on 
all three of our boys. And it brings us all together to be able to, uh, you know, previously cheer on Eric, who's my oldest, then Kevin, and now Jeffrey, the, uh, the third to come through the program. Jeffrey is not only following his brother's footsteps today, the whole family is ski crazy. Ken's mother was the 1948 Canadian champion. She instilled in our whole family uh, that love of skiing and uh, both my, myself and my younger brother went on to the national team and Olympic teams. Uh, on Linda's side, uh, same thing, that's uh, actually more skiing because both uh, Jake and Jerry Robbins are very active skiers. Linda was actually the 1981 Canadian champ and her mother Jerry is still skiing and came to Whistler to see Jeffrey. Well, I was quite excited to see him and get the big hug. <laughs> he was busy giving everybody hugs. I got a charge out of that. Oh, it's pretty awesome just to have all the support and have a little cheering squad when you get to the finish. Yeah. Definitely boost confidence and probably help me out a little. All right, smile. For Ken Reed and his entire family, skiing is more than a hobby or a sport. It's a way of weaving the family From together. Alberta, Jeffrey Reed. This year, Christmas time, we had everybody home, which is a rarity now because they're traveling all over the world. And uh, the first thing they asked to do was, can we go skiing together as a family? And that's pretty, pretty cool. Jeffrey Reed has since made it onto the Canadian Alpine ski team, and he's had some notable finishes the last few years in the NORAM circuit. Now let's take a look at 2015. We had host Vanessa Ibarra catch up with another rising ski star. Her name is Christina Natalenko, and she's got roots in the Whistler Cup. Like most competitive alpine skiers, Christina Natalenko likes to go fast, really fast. When you're going so fast, then you can hear like the whistling in your helmet. You're racing the world, kind of. It's a feeling you can't really describe. That love of speed, taking the 15-year-old athlete halfway around the globe. Natalenko having recently returned from competing in the world-renowned Topolino ski race in Italy. However, her biggest accomplishment? Being the only BC athlete to win an Alpine medal at this year's Canada Winter Games, nabbing silver in the GS competition. That's something I'm going to remember. I was really surprised, but I was really happy because GS isn't my strongest event, but I was I was still far behind from the girl who won, but I know what to work for now. <laughs> Doing just that, training five days a week in the gym or here outside her new Westminster home. The lifelong skier also hitting the slopes throughout the week with the Grouse Mountain Taiyi Ski Club. Her next challenge, the 23rd annual Whistler Cup. There's all these countries together and you're racing different people and you don't know how you're gonna do. Just have to try your best and go as fast as you can. And meeting all these people, just amazing. <laughs> my goals for this is I just try my best and ski like I normally do. Don't get my nerves in the way of my skiing because that happens a lot to me. I just have to listen to my coach and just go full attack. This the Ukrainian-born athletes last year competing in slalom, giant slalom, and Super G U16 races. Natalenko moving up to the U18 FIST program next year. With Austrians and Italians continuing to be her toughest rivals, the stronger she gets, so does the competition. Italians are someone they'd come down and just be so much ahead in different style of skiing, especially on like an icy pitch. You'd notice that if you don't have enough leg muscle, you won't be able to hold the turn or if you don't have enough like strength or like a start. A good start matters a lot, so you need arm strength and muscle for a good jump start. I feel like this year in particular, I'm more mentally stronger and like I'm more open to what my coaches say and I try to train harder and I realize the competition is so much bigger and I actually have to <laughs> train which is what she'll continue to do. Natalenko's ultimate goal to one day compete in the Olympics. However, for now, her eyes remain on Whistler, competing in the sport she loves, having fun along the way. I just want to be happy, like keep loving skiing and be able to enjoy it and train every day and just make sure I learn something every day from each experience in skiing, yeah, improve. I'm not thinking of results. That's, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, things to work on.
Christina is now a member of the BC Ski Team and she's been hitting up the BC Cup and Nor Am circuits. She's definitely a young athlete to continue keeping an eye on. Now the Whistler Cup was designed for kids the ages 12 to 15 to get a taste of international ski racing competition. And you can see how driven everyone is. But it's not just about the competition, it's also about having some fun. And the Parade of Nations is the opportunity to do just that. It lets them show their team spirit and let loose a little bit. And the parade in 2017 was no exception. Why is there a fire truck driving through town and why are all these kids screaming and waving flags? It's a great way to break the ice and have some interaction and then everybody asks what's the Whistler Cup and the kids have the opportunity to explain why they are here in Whistler. The Parade of Nations officially kicks off the annual festivities. The focus of Whistler Village is solely on these young athletes as they follow the Whistler Cup through town. The idea is to bring all of the nations together and to showcase them to all of the village of Whistler. It's been pretty cool so far. It's really awesome. It's a really cool experience. I'm really excited for the parade. My cousin was in it, so I'm really excited. I was like, oh, I want to be like her. Mount Seymour! Go Whitewater! I think it's really a highlight for them. It's a really good opportunity for them to meet some of the other teams and some of the other athletes that are here. We have a really fun band that's leading the kids in the parade and we have the return of some really high profile ski teams this year including the US and Switzerland and France are back to race with us. They walk with the old fire truck and they wave their flags and they get all the attention they deserve. We love the Whistler Cup! There is never a dull moment at the Whistler Cup, so come and be a part of the excitement. The Parade of Nations is happening Friday, April 13th, right here in Whistler Village, and be sure to head up the mountain from April 13th through to April 15th for all of the ski racing action. For Shaw TV, Sea to Sky, I'm Christy Alexich. Good luck to all the racers out there, and have an awesome 2018 Whistler Cup.